Okay. Today we have our second lecture on uh, introduction to quantum mechanics. And in the first lecture, we talked about uh, the uh, events that led to some understanding that we must change our classical ideas if we need to understand the experiments uh, like uh, photoelectric effect, Compton effect, uh, do ex uh, electron diffraction experiments. You need to have some new physics. So in, in an attempt to understand uh, these new experiments that came up, we had some interesting proposals. So let me discuss what we had uh, talked about in our last lecture. In the last lecture, I told you that in our classical world, we have uh, matter and radiation. These are the two entities that we deal with. And matter is having particle features like you, it obeys the laws of motion. You can apply forces and then there are trajectories. And the radiation, the electromagnetic wave, is actually obeying wave equations. And, and waves are different from particles in the sense that waves are non-localized. They are not at one point. They are separate all over that uh, in any wave, the energy goes in all the possible directions. And, but for particles, the energy is localized at one point. The example is that when you fire a blade, the entire energy of the blade goes from the blade to the target and it takes a certain specific path in space-time. Whereas when you speak, as a wave disturbance is created, and that wave disturbance goes in every direction. It doesn't follow a specific direction. So there were two pillars of classical physics. One was the laws of motion, which defined the dynamics of the particles, and the other was the theory of electromagnetism that defined the properties of light. And uh, both the theories had a feature called a determinist, determinism, that if you, you fix the initial state and you fix the forces and fields, then you will be able to make predictions uh, the future predictions. For example, the electromagnetic wave theory predicted the constancy in the velocity of light. So it's, it's a kind of determinism that was intrinsic in the fabric of classical physics. Uh, so we talked about uh, the problems like uh, light ordinarily behaves like a wave, but in an experiment called the photoelectric effect, it behaves like a particle. When the light uh, falls on metal objects, uh, met material objects like metals, then it knocks down electrons out. And the only way you can explain this phenomena is to imagine that these uh, lights, uh, light not is not composed of particles, but it's composed of, is not composed of waves, sorry, but it's composed of particles. And uh, there were many experimental results that were obtained in photoelectric experiment. And all those experimental results were explainable only on the basis that the energy that is carried by light is in the form of quantas and that energy is shared by the electron and and the it takes a, it is it's it's it is uh, absorbed by electron and a part of it is used by electron in coming out from the metal surface and a part goes as kinetic energy then we also figured out that electrons in certain circumstances can behave like waves. There was a proposal by de Broglie that if light can behave as particles, the particles can also behave like waves. He made a proposal just on the basis that nature follows symmetry. So what is this electron diffraction experiment? It tells us that if we have a beam of electrons that is incident on a nickel target, then the pattern of diffraction of scattering is very close to the diffraction pattern. And that can only be understood if we end a wave property to the electrons. So we are having uh, waves behaving like particles, like electromagnetic waves behaving like particles, and we have particles, electrons behaving like waves in experiments like Davison and German experiment. Now, this is one of the most important slides that I will discuss. So you have seen this is a very interesting experimental setting where we have an aluminum foil. And first, the experiment is done with the help of uh, X-rays. When the X-rays are incident on this foil, then uh, we have a diffraction pattern. And uh, that diffraction pattern is given in the photograph shown here. So this photograph shown here shows the experimental, uh, in the pattern that we obtain when the X-rays pass through a 
aluminum foil and on screen we get a diffraction pattern and look at this pattern this is the kind of pattern you people are already aware about we have similar kinds of pattern in optics when you talk about say newton rings and that uh, light also forms rings when it gets diffracted so this these rings can only be explained on uh, by a wave theory that the light when emerging or x rays when emerging and uh, from the from the aluminum foil interfere constructively and destructively and form these beautiful patterns the same experiment was done with the beam of electrons so it was done with the same experiment was done with electrons and a similar pattern you can see this pattern here on top is shown similar pattern was obtained it was the pattern that was obtained remember when you you place a detector on the screen you will not get electron as a wave you, it will just you will always get electrons as particles but the pattern that they will make is a wave like pattern and what was the explanation to this wave like pattern the only explanation to this wave like pattern is that electrons are they are waves so instead of electrons treating as particles if we treat them as waves and we say that the wave associated with them the wavelength associated with them is given by the de broglie relation then we can easily explain this pattern so this is the kind of experiment that is marvelous that we can see that that how why what forces us to imagine that there are waves which are associated with the electrons but remember whenever we do an experiment whenever we try to track an electron then it is no experiment on earth or no experiment has ever been reported where you can actually see something varying with the electron whenever you try detect an electron you will always detect as a whole particle but the patterns that it makes on the screens like in the experiment of this kind they are wave like patterns so this is very interesting that uh, that uh, x rays which we know are waves now electrons which we know are particles but they show wave like behavior and uh, this confirms that de broglie's idea was perfect that uh, he had hit the bull's eye by by postulating that uh, their um, waves are associated with particles okay now uh what schrodinger is did is that he applied this concept of de broglie's wave to the had atom say hydrogen atom and uh, what he found is that these uh, de broglie waves could make standing waves right and and that would be the reason that electron is not radiating when it is in a stationary state so stationary state he interpreted as standing waves of electron waves uh, making standing waves around and around the nucleus of an atom and uh, he was able to address the quantization role for example the angular momentum quantization which was a postulate in bohr theory could be easily obtained if we guess that these uh, waves associated with the electron they form standing waves so he applied the de broglie concept to apply in these cases to figure out the quantization rules and then there were lots of uh, colloquium that were held in that year uh, and where this uh, this this uh, wave aspects or de broglie waves were discussed very thoroughly and in one of the colloquia this came up this is quite interesting and i would like to uh, repeat every word of it in one of the next colloquia early in 1926 schrodinger gave a beautifully clear account of how de broglie associated a wave with a particle and how he could obtain the quantization rules by demanding that an integer number of waves should be fitted along a stationary orbit the way i explained when he had finished debay debay and debay was a very well known scientist casually remarked that he thought this way of talking was rather childish and i i i i uh, emphasize here said that you know this is quite interesting that what what debay remarked was very very interesting thing one what he said is that that he said that uh, talking about the standing wave is rather is rather childish one should deal properly with waves we should have a proper wave theory so one had to have so this was main idea that one had to have a wave equation and if we really want to make sense of the waves that are associated with the particles then then should, there should be a wave equation that should be associated with the particle so this came up if one of the colloquia in 
26. So therefore, uh, Schrodinger, you know, was a very uh, intelli intelligent fellow. He started working on, on wave theory of particles. So how could he develop an equation for a, a wave equation that would describe the motion of particles? So that's the main idea he was looking for. So before we go there, let's uh, discuss the classical wave equation. Now, a classical wave equation looks like this. So let me let me tell you, uh, uh, let me show you this, this interesting thing. Uh, this is the classical wave equation. It looks like this. So what is this equation? It is del two a wave function divided by del x square is equal to one by c square del two xi by del t square. Now, what does this wave equation tell us? It relates the second derivative of the wave function with the second derivative, space derivative of the wave function with the second derivative uh, of uh, the wave function with respect to time. And uh, it is solution will satisfy any solution that will satisfy this equation is a legal equation that represents a wave. Now, what is the xi? Xi here is a wave function. It could be, if it's a wave on a string, it could be just the displacement function. Or if it is an electromagnetic wave, this could be electric and magnetic fields. Electric magnetic fi electromagnetic fields are the wave functions for electromagnetic wave. And this C is the velocity with which the wave is propagating. For electromagnetic wave, it's a fixed constant, which we call as the velocity of light. Now, if we try with the, this uh, solution, uh, this equation, this, e this, this equation has many solutions. A simpler one could be this kind of equation. And if you just see this equation easily satisfies uh, the second order differential of waves and um, wave equation. And uh, all we need is to double differentiate with respect to time. We get minus omega square xi naught cos of kx minus omega t. And we get back psi of xt. And then we uh, double differentiate with respect to time. And then we uh, double differentiate with respect to space. And then we substitute them back in the main equation. And we get a relation that this, this is the solution. This, this equation is the solution provided omega is equal to kc. So that is the solution provided this omega is equal to kc. That's fine, but we can also know, we, we can also use einstein de Broglie relations like uh, uh, omega is e by h bar and p is h bar k. We can use them and we figure out that we get energy momentum relation for electromagnetic waves. For electromagnetic waves, the energy momentum relation is, is PC because there is no rest of mass associated. So remember that a wave equation that we have has to satisfy the energy momentum relation. This is the wave equation of classical waves, say an electromagnetic wave or even sound waves or any mechanical waves do satisfy the same kind of equation. And xi, which we call as wave function, is something that is associated with that wave. Anything, anything that is waving, that is changing. In case of, say, sound wave, it could be the pressure of the gas that is changing. So in case of waves on a string, it is the displacement function that is changing. And in case of electric and magnetic fields, and it is, the, uh, it is this, uh, those are the wave functions uh, which are changing in time. So in fact, uh, all we should see is that this differential equation governs the propagation of the waves and they satisfy the energy momentum relation. And this is very important. This is the catch. Energy momentum relation is the catch. So in order to develop the equation for the motion of the waves uh, that are associated with the particle, the uh, Schrodinger took uh, advantage of the energy momentum relation. He looked at the energy momentum relation of the particles and he tried to develop a Schrodinger wave equation. So at that time, relativity was already in around the corner. So what he did is that he looked at the energy momentum relation, which is relativistic. So this is the relativistic energy momentum relation and he tried to build a wave equation around that relation, but he failed. He failed because of issues in probability interpretation and uh, there were other issues also. He could not uh, interpret things properly and he had uh, the issues with this equation and therefore he failed to develop a wave equation that would guarantee this equation. So what he next tried is that 
he worked in the non relativistic case and got a great success so we will see in that case how it works for a non relativistic case so then uh, okay so Okay, so then he looked for this energy momentum relation, which is E equal to P square by 2M plus V. And this relation is non-relativistic relation. And uh, he tried to build an equation around, around this equation. So a wave equation that would finally respect this equation had to be postulated. One thing I would like to remind you that Turing equation cannot be derived. It is like the uh, basic, uh, action in the theory. It's like Newton's laws, which you cannot derive, they just postulate them. In the same sense, you know, in the basic uh, fabric of quantum mechanics, we postulate um, Schrodinger equation. All you can see is that you can verify it with experiments, but you cannot derive it. But we can always see the ideas that led to this equation. So that's what we are discussing right now. What kind, what should be your expectations from the equation? What should it satisfy and how he was able to just to propose an equation like this? So that is the main idea. So therefore he had a proposal and that proposal was, that proposal was uh, this equation. So that proposal was this equation, this equation. And this equation is famously called as Schrodinger equation. Let me read this equation, minus h cross square by 2m del to psi of xt by del x square plus v of xt psi of xt is equal to ih bar psi of xt by dt. So all we should see is that this, uh, finally this equation should respect the non-relativistic uh, no relativistic equation energy momentum relation. So uh, one can try with a very simple solution, say psi of xt is cos of kx y and omega t. And if we substitute, we can easily figure out that this does not satisfy the equation. So this is not an acceptable solution. Then we can try say a e to, a e to power i kx minus omega t. And this time we get the success. We figure out that that exactly satisfies this equation. Not only that, we can also figure out that once we substitute, say we take the time derivative, then we take twice the space derivative. When we take time derivative for this wave function, a e to power i kx minus omega t, it is minus i omega psi. And when we take twice space derivative, it is minus kx k square psi. And we substitute them back in the Schrodinger equation. And what we get is a, a relation which is, uh, momentum energy relation for particles. So therefore, it looks that the proposal is okay, decent, there are the solutions, they, they respect the solutions that respect uh, the energy momentum relations. Now, you can ask like, a very interesting question, what is the psi xt here? Because what is the physical reality of the psi xt? What kind of wave function, what's waving for, for, for a particle, for say for an electron, what's waving there? So this has no physical interpretation because whenever you look at a particle, you will not see anything waving with the particle. So it is a complex uh, wave function uh, in general, and uh, it has no physical interpretation in the sense that uh, a wave can never be uh, observed for the particles, but it's, uh, it was interpreted by Born that it is not psi that makes sense, but psi psi star that would make sense. That's called the probabilistic interpretation of the wave function. But mathematically, it's also something that is a wave function that is waving for the particle. It's like that only. And it's, it's like what you think about, uh, say, electrical magnetic field for electromagnetic waves, right? It's something like that, but it's, it doesn't have a physical reality. But what Max Born proposed was very interesting. He said that it is size size star that makes sense and size size star defines the probability density. So for probability of the particle to be found in say region dx, it will be mod of psi xt whole square dx. And uh, since particle is always somewhere, so if I integrate it between minus infinity to plus infinity, it has to be equal to one. This condition is called as normalization of the wave function. And also very important to remark here, very important to tell you here that uh, this uh, differential equation 
there is this, we have these imaginary numbers or imaginary functions coming in, or these imaginary numbers or these imaginary wave functions, just mathematical simplicity. The answer in is that it's not like that only. It's not like that. In classical mechanics, in these complex numbers are used for mathematical convenience, but in this quantum world, they are there all the time. So you will see that in, 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 in it cannot be avoided. There could be, of course, wave functions which are real. Say, for example, wave functions that uh, represent particles in a box, but uh, in general, wave functions are complex. And in general, the Schrodinger equation demands complexity of the wave function if you have to uh, address the problem of, uh, say, time reversal. A time reversal system cannot, we cannot address the problem of time reversal if the equation is not complex. It has to be complex. So complex uh, uh, functions are uh, intrinsically present in the quantum mechanical structure. We cannot do with real functions. So then uh, the next problem is, uh, uh, is about how to apply it and how to solve this equation. So that is the interesting part of it. So now we have a basic postulate or fundamental postulate you call a Schrodinger equation. The question is now you have a Newton's law of motion, how do you apply it? Or what, what are the applications of Schrodinger equation? So that is our next uh, topic that we will be discussing, the applications of Schrodinger equation. But we'll keep things very simple. We'll first take the potentials that are independent of time. So I take a potential that does not depend on time, then there is a lot of mathematical advantage with this equation. And and if you take potential that does not depend on time, it turns out that the time and space variables can easily be separated. So let us now look into that part of it. So separation of time and space dependencies of the wave function. Now I have a wave function and I say that I can write it in the product form. And this is purely my assumption. So keep this in mind. This is, uh, one minute. Uh, I need to anecdote a bit. So I need to use a pen and paper. So this, this is purely an assumption that psi of x t is equal to psi of x phi of t is an assumption. And uh, how do I know it's correct? Because I make correct predictions. So if with this proposal and taking time independent potentials, I'm able to make correct predictions, say I can apply the same assumption in Schrodinger in a hydrogen atom and uh, figure out all the properties of hydrogen atom and they exactly match with the experiments, then it turns out that my proposal is a correct proposal. Initially, it is just a proposal. Fine. And then I take a potential which is independent of time. Do I have such potentials? Yes, we have plenty of them. For example, in classical mechanics, we come across a gravitational potential, which is independent of uh, time, but the gravitational potential is that we will not use in this equation because uh, quantum mechanics is not applicable at large scale. But uh, we have a Coulomb potential, which is like gravitational potential, one by X dependent, and that will make a lot of sense because we'll apply Schrodinger equation to hydrogen atom. Then there are problems like like a harmonic oscillator problem where potential is only a function of x. So again, I can use and apply and look into what's called as quantum mechanical oscillator. And then I can have some uh, regions where the potential is actually zero, a free particle. That would be the simplest of all potentials that you take a free particle where it neither depends on time nor depends on space and you get free particle solutions. So the interesting thing is that, that I take the wave function and I take it as a product form and provided my my potential is time independent. Now I substitute it. And when I substitute it, what do I have? Since they are partial derivatives and I can pull this time derivatives here, I can pull space derivative out. Here I can pull time derivative out. And then I divide the whole equation with this factor, psi x and phi x, phi t. And I get the left side, which is, oh, sorry. I get the left side, which is a function of, x only, and I get a right side, which is function of t only. The left side, since it's a function of x alone, and right side is a function of t alone, both can be equated to some constant. Okay, I need to actually rub these uh, notations because uh, it goes to the next slide and the next slide will look ugly. So anyway, thank you. So what I do is now is, is uh, make separation of variables effective and I separate out completely the x dependence from the time. So I have two different equations. One is only in terms of x and the other is uh, 
only in terms of time. So this is only x dependent equation and this is only time dependent equation. This is time dependent equation. Okay. Now solving this time dependent equation is very, very easy because it has it's it, it has it's only linear single derivative equation, just a little adjustment and taking integration, one can easily figure it out and the solution turns out to be this one. So psi of t is equal to e to power minus i c t by h bar. Now you can easily see the c should be energy at least in dimensions because t by h bar is one by energy and exponentials are always uh, dimensionless. So c has to be some energy constant and I uh, substitute for c, I substitute for uh, substitute e. So psi of t is e to power minus i e t divided by h bar. So the time dependent uh, equation has been solved and a solution is of this kind. It's a kind of a phase. So now my wave function is psi of x and phi of t. Psi of t is, phi of t is already solved. All I need is to look for the solution of this equation. So what, what is famously called as time independent Schrodinger equation. This one where c is to be replaced by now. C is, uh, c is to be replaced by now. E. So that is the Schrodinger equation in time independent form. Okay, so again, uh, because I told you this goes to the next secret, so I have to, I have to rub it off. Okay, fine. So now uh, uh, what I do is that I need to solve this equation. The only thing is that I need to, because time dependent has already been done. Now I need to solve time independent equation. Now it depends on what is the potential, right? So it would depend on what the potential is. This potential is, so the potential would tell us uh, the results of this differential equation. So for different potentials, you can solve this equation, you can get different answers and you can build up the entire mechanics for various problems. For example, I can choose this to be a harmonic oscillator kind and I can address the problem of harmonic oscillator quantum mechanically. Or I can choose it as, as one by X type, uh, say, for a hydrogen atom and I can solve the problem of hydrogen atom and uh, all potentials where we don't have time dependence, all we need is to solve time independent Schrodinger equation. And then the final solution, psi xt would be equal to the product solution. And remember these phases cancel out, e to power i e t by h bar, e to power minus i e t by h bar, they cancel out. And uh, the probability is only dictated by the time independent parts, say time independent wave functions. So the problem is now fully solvable. So this is how we proceed in quantum mechanics. Now, since your course is at introductory level, we'll look at various kinds of problems and which you will solve with this equation. And what are the conditions that psi must have? Psi must satisfy a uh, Schrodinger equation and it must exist and psi and its derivative must be continuous. Psi and its derivative must be finite everywhere. Psi and its derivative must be single value. That's very important. And that we know, in fact, since it's a wave function, and even classical mechanics, we have wave functions like uh, electric and magnetic fields, they are single value uh, in, in space uh, time. So they have to be single valued, otherwise it won't make sense. Uh, and then psi must go to zero and as x goes to infinity, the reason is that the normalization integral would otherwise diverge. So if we want that normalization integral should not diverge, it should always converge to give you some uh, answer that is meaningful. So, so far so nice. So this was the basically the content of our second lecture. And uh, in our third lecture, we will start uh, applying uh, Schrodinger equation to various cases. And uh, the first case that I will discuss with you people is uh, how to apply Schrodinger equation for an infinite potential problem, infinite well problem, uh, where inside the potential is zero and on the walls the potential is infinite. So we'll build up one dimensional problems one by one. Thank you very much. Uh,